I want to do just a brief welcome and overview. Um, I do offer these ground rules. As you all know, I offer ground rules at most meetings. These are pretty simple ones that will help us, I hope, for have active dialogue on the webinar. If you can push your mute button on your phone, that's awesome. Um, and only unmute it when you have something that you'd like to contribute to the conversation. I also um, ask if you can silence your other noisemakers that may be in your office or near your computer, your cell phones. Uh, if you have your computers on, please turn those off. Um, the noise from that can be distracting. Don't put your phone on hold. Um, if you do have to leave us for a bit, just keep it on mute and walk away because if you put it on hold, sometimes we get your muse act. And sometimes that's great, but other times not so great. Um, if you can use the chat function to ask questions, raise comments, uh, concerns, that's ideal. But we also do want and need dialogue, and we've actually built in times on the agenda for discussion. So we do want you to talk verbally. We do want that to be facilitated. Um, so that's why we're using the ready talk because sometimes that's not as easy to facilitate if you're recording through the computer speakers. It's really hard to practice this last ground rule, which is one person speaks at a time, because we're not in the same room and we're not able to see each other. So there will be times when we talk over one another, uh, not on purpose, and that's when the chat can really help me and Susie facilitate the conversation. I should also say that um, Susie's going to be recording pieces of the dialogue um, during the meeting, and we'll pull up a note screen on um, our computer screen so we can track it as if we had a flip chart with us. And both Kim um, Ingram and Ann Lombardo are taking notes um, so that we'll have those written notes as well. So that's sort of the welcome and overview to the webinar itself. Um, so here's our agenda for the day. Um, and we will wrap up by noon. So um, that's our commitment to you. Um, Lynn's going to give the overview of the final report, and then there's a combination of Lynn, Maggie, and Susie giving you input. The management recommendations and some of the lessons learned are actually an opportunity for you to also um, give us your feedback on those things. And then we'll talk about the integration metrics and the final report, things that it sounds like all of you are very interested in. And then this next steps and evaluation is really your chance to give us feedback. So I think all, if not most of you on the line, know the general framework for the Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Project, um, the fact that it really is a collaborative framework and that we're really looking at multiple resources, primarily the water, wildlife, forest health, and the role of public participation in this collaborative effort. It's really an effort to engage the scientists and the public and the private stakeholders and others throughout the entire process. Uh, I think most of you, if not all on the line, are familiar with our study areas um, and um, some of the data that um, will be shared with you today gives you an idea of how the public conversations and public input portions of the work have been around these areas and outside and um, nationally and internationally to these areas. So I think it's going to be pretty exciting for you to see some of that information. I also think most of you know that the framework for the research teams um, in terms of how our science team is um, put together and our role uh, as public participation is really one of the essential elements for the integration portion of the project. So we will want and need your feedback on how well we're working towards that goal. So um, we are looking at fuels treatments in terms of um, effects on the, the landscape, both the short and the long-term effects on all of these parameters. And um, it's been a pretty exciting and wild ride the last several years. Um, and we really will want and need your input on how we best prepare not just the integration, but the next steps to inform the agencies and others working in collaborative adaptive management. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn, um, who will talk to us a bit about how we're framing at least the public participation portion of the final report. 
And I'm going to put my phone on mute, Lynn, and you can go. That's correct, right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Thank you. I did have my phone on mute, which took me a minute to figure out how to unmute it. Um, I'm going to give you just a brief overview of the chapter that we're preparing for the SNAP final report. And I would like to start by pointing out that the final report, the development of it over the next few months, is somewhat iterative. Uh, the administration of SNAP, Peter Hopkinson and John Battles, they um, are giving us guidance on what the shape of the final report will be, and then we are responsible for doing an additional section that's on public participation in general, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. Our goals are in our chapter are to create an overview of our activities, let people know what we've done, of course, um, highlight our main findings and our activities, and then to help with uh, transferability. In other words, we would like to transfer what we've learned to the next people that might be involved in uh, collaborative adaptive management and to extension personnel of the future as well. So there is a, a big goal of providing something that's of use to people on down the line. And now, so the outline of the report that we've come up with is obviously we have an introduction and executive summary. We have a section on participation, which highlights our outreach activities, and um, we, I have some things listed there, the collaborative adaptive management workshops, the SOX effort, which got so much press, and how methods have adapted, methods of outreach have adapted and grown through the project. For example, we started out having multiple giant annual meetings and realized that we needed smaller uh, venues where we could have more discussion to talk about each topic, and then we developed the IT meetings. Engagement, how are people participating? Where do they get information? How do they use it? Uh, Maggie and Chu Fei are going to talk about some of the things they're doing today, so there'll be a section on that. Each of these sections will have a summary at the beginning, too. And then Adriana and I have been looking at using interviews and surveys to look at how people have learned and worked together through the project and what they've uh, found out as a result of SNAP and this collaborative project, project and what they think of it and the role of the university and everything else. We'll have a conclusion, and we're going to provide some lessons learned. And what I, one of the things I hope to get out of this project, uh, or this webinar today, is to learn what you think are the most important lessons learned. And when we put together lessons learned, we have about 20 pages of details. We need to know from you what matters. Uh, and then we'll have appendices, which will include all our published papers, newsletters, manuscripts, and so on. So to finish up here, if I can push the right button, each of our chapters will provide an executive summary, so you don't have to read more than a paragraph if you don't want to. Uh, we'll state our objectives, we'll highlight our results and findings, and we'll draw on something called the logic model, which is going to be talked about uh, next. Uh, and, of course, we had an extensive lit review of every collaborative adaptive management project that's ever appeared in the literature, and so we'll put that, uh, use that uh, in this chapter as well. So that is um, just the mechanics of the PPT part of the final report. All right, so Maggie. So I'm um, going to take over uh, the next section, and Susie and I are going to talk about some of the things, the specifics that we've been doing in public participation. And as you all know, we've taken a very um, wide-ranging approach to our public participation. We have uh, run public meetings, field trips, workshops, webinars like this one, and websites, of course, that many of you have been involved in. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit now in this section about what this means for our public participation footprint. What is the big picture of how we've engaged with people? And we want to go back to the beginning when we talked in SNAP about what it means in, for SNAP, how do we evaluate, how do we build, and we talked a lot about results process and relationships. That's what we've been our foundation for SNAP. So results, moving outwards, who do we contact, how do we do that, process, what have we learned about how to perform, how to do such, such a collaborative project, and then relationships, what are the connections we've made and how have these networks sustained us um, through this project. So right now, Susie and I are going to talk about this SNAP footprint and this results process relationship approach. 
she's going to focus on the outreach, the, the, the contacts that we've made um, throughout this project, and then I'm going to talk about the research that Xu Fei's done in understanding the information networks that we've built through SNAMP. So right now, I'm going to turn the slides over to Susie, and she's going to talk about the outreach component. Thanks, thanks, Maggie. Um, let's see, I'm going to move forward and show you this very uh, dense slide. Uh, and this is part of our logic model. Now, a logic model is just sort of a program development version of a conceptual model for you um, more natural or ecological scientists who have built conceptual models. Logic models are commonly used in extension programs and a variety of social programs. And if you follow me on the left side, we have um, the inputs. And the inputs are basically just the, uh, the things it takes to develop your program. So we have a number of personnel, attendance, resources, and such. Uh, the next column is the output. So what are you actually doing? And I have um, these sorts of things to report on to you. And the whole reason for doing these things would be to actually get to outcomes. So to the right, you have short, medium, and long-term outcomes. And so we are measuring a number of our short and medium outcomes uh, and some of our long-term outcomes. Um, but this is what we would say is the reason why we're doing outreach. So for example, presentations to local and regional groups, uh, you're hoping that stakeholders learn about it. And through their input, you're hoping for improved analysis, broader support, more participants, and diverse participation. So that's how the flow on this goes. And in the long term, you may get to some um, long-term outcomes with stakeholders being informed and having increased shared understanding. So as a team, we have built several of these logic models for why we're doing what we're doing. And then the social scientists on the team have as well been measuring some of these things to tell us if it's working. So I'm going to tell you just about the outputs, but I don't want you to think that it's um, bean counting for bean counting's sake, but because it's part of the model that you move towards the end. So this is a graph I've shown a number of times, updated through the end of December. This is the number of um, public involvement events between 2005 and 2013 that's been hosted by SNAMP and our partners uh, and our outreach team. So we started in 2005 with a number of public meetings to help develop the work plan. Um, and then the project adopted a specific place-based uh, outreach strategy to get more people involved. And so our um, outreach worker in the South, that's Ann, was hired in 2007. I came on in 2008. And then Kim and the Northern site came on in, at the end of, in the middle of 2008. And so with increased staff, this is a lesson learned that seems obvious, but um, to do uh, vigorous outreach and involvement, you really do need people dedicated to doing that. Um, these green bars are specifically presentations done by our outreach staff to involve people who would not normally be involved in a SNAMP event. Perhaps they would not attend our meetings um, but they go to other meetings, like uh, local service clubs. They might be board of supervisors. And we inform them and involve them in the process through these types of events. Um, we have management workshops. Some of our LIDAR management workshops are um, collaboration workshops. Those are the blue over here um, that we've been doing a lot of recently. And um, then... IT meetings you're participating in right now, those are the yellow ones, as you see. So um, overall, that leads to a lot of events and a broad diversity of participation. So I've been doing the final report write-up, um, and I just wanted to highlight you know, how much of this stuff, what the outputs are over the last seven years. Um, public and annual meetings, science integration team meetings, this is one. We've had um, 
lots of field trips. We've had scientists give talks when it's not as convenient to give field trips. For example, with the Pacific Fisher, um, if there's discomfort with showing where their areas are to the public, then instead our scientists have been giving talks to schools and then management workshops. So those top four are the entire teams and the scientists actually um, giving talks and interacting with the with the public. The next three are where our outreach team is specifically going out and involving people by going to their meetings, presenting or presenting them at other events and special projects. Um, so I just wanted to show what the teams have been up to. So these are the science teams. So the Fisher has done 11 different outreach um, events over the last seven years, uh, forest team, here's uh, PPT, and water at the end there. So there's been, um, you know, pretty broad participation by all our teams. And these that say all teams, those are pretty much all the annual meetings where all the teams are involved. Um, and then these are the people we've been talking to. So of the events, some of them are basically aimed at agency staff. There's been a few uh, aimed at arts groups. Civics groups. Our, our largest number so far has been um, students and teachers. Uh, if you add Fisher to the OWL outreach, that's a pretty large number too, aimed at wildlife groups. Um, forestry groups here, fire um, like SAF and other groups interested in forestry, fire, fire safe councils, that sort of thing. So that gives you an overview of who specifically we've been talking to. Um, and then we just recently put together this map, thanks to help from Maggie, uh, to show where the events have been held. So these in-person events have been pretty dispersed, uh, a lot of them throughout the Sierra, and um, you know concentrated along the study sites in Forest Hill and Oakhurst, but then also throughout that area. And Sacramento has been a pretty common meeting place for us, but not a lot in San Francisco or other more urban areas. It's really focusing on more rural areas. So that was everything we've done in person. Um, we've done a lot of things uh, at a distance as well, which Maggie will be telling you more about. But um, in-person events, you can really talk to people and develop relationships and understanding. Um, we think about our at a distance outreach goals differently. You're increasing awareness to perhaps uh, non-traditional participants. Um, you're transmitting information. You have some limited interaction. And then the repository is the, this is the SNAP website. So there's just a ton of information on there that people could access at their leisure. So um, we've been doing a number of these as well, which you're no doubt familiar with, press releases, newsletters. Uh, research briefs have been a real focus of ours because we get feedback that a lot of participants don't necessarily want to read a lot of detailed journal articles, so we have briefed every one of the published papers that are available on the website. Uh, web update emails, one came today, uh, the email list, blogs, social media, we're trying to do it all. Um, and Pat, I see that you asked a question there about the number of people. Is that a cumulative count? No, those are actually the number of, um, let me just go back real quick. Those are the number of attendants. So it's some of these are duplicated. Those aren't 7,300 separate people, but those are the number of people over time, I hope. I was asking that with respect to the map. The map. Okay. Let's look at the map. Um, meeting attendance. So those can be different people as well. So if we had a meeting with, you know, 50 people in Oakhurst, and then we had another meeting with 50 people, we didn't necessarily go through and identify if those were separate people. That would show up as a, the number 100 there in Oakhurst. Right. I just wanted to, you know, make clear that we didn't have any meetings with 1,121 people attending a single that's meeting. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point. So, yeah, I... I think when you put this on the web, if you could clarify what that means, that it's cumulative across meetings and, you know, how are people counted, as you just described. Oh, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you. just added this map to the report, so yeah. thank you for that. We will mm -hmm. work hard to make that clearer. Um, 
let's see. Uh, and so this is also a new map, and it's using the same way of counting. And this was one that Maggie helped with as well. This compares what I just showed you, the meeting attendance in person, with the hits from the website. So what you see on the left, let's see, where's my arrow? These are people attending meetings uh, in person, and then these are where our web hits are coming from. So you can see from this map that a lot of our web use is from larger urban areas, some place like Los Angeles and uh, the Bay Area. And so by that we really see that we are getting um, a broader participation, if you want to call the web stuff that, or at least informed about the project through our different outreach methods. So thanks for the map, Maggie. Okay, so that is what I wanted to tell you about participation, how we've gone about it over the last seven years and what the outputs have been. Um, one thing that the public participation team has been doing over the last year and a half is putting together collaboration workshops. So these come under the category mm -hmm. of management workshops in all of my previous graphs. And our concept has been that at the end of 2014, um, there will be a big report and there will be agencies and stakeholders moving forward uh, based on research findings, ideally. And so our, the public participation outreach team has been focusing on helping build the capacity for future collaboration um, when we are no longer in the mix. Although we understand that the agencies and many stakeholders are very actively doing that right now, we've been trying to broaden the capacity amongst stakeholders and um, different um, agencies. So we have been hosting this uh, series of workshops with the idea that we're helping in the future. So in 2012, we developed a 17-unit training module uh, and we held workshops for 100 managers and stakeholders in 2013. We've just started another series um, this year. Uh, we developed an online collaborative tool site with the curriculum and the potential for discussing for mutual support. This is just some of the uh, units that we've been teaching. It's about 12 hours of instruction in each one of the workshop series, and that is a picture of the cover of the book, which is now uh, complete and on the SNAP website, free, downloadable, not copyrighted. It's written as a train-the-trainer type of style of curriculum, and so you could um, use this with your staff if you wanted to go through some exercise on um, uh, developing objectives or logistics of su successful meetings. So we've had uh, quite a broad range of folks attending, federal agencies, state agencies, university folks, uh, local government and nonprofits, as well as conservation organizations, uh, farmers, consultants, that sort of thing. People who really think that it's in their best interest to uh, improve their collaboration skills. And we've had great um, uh, lessons learned from those folks given back to us. They've been just critical in developing the overall curriculum. We've learned so much from our participants, as we always do. So um, we are looking currently at a series of pre- and post-assessments to see what the outcomes of these workshops have been. Um, we also ask them when they register what they're most concerned about as far as collaboration goes. And this was from a recent um, workshop a, a registrant. He said he was most concerned about having enough time, if he was going to collaborate, to dedicate to getting all stakeholders in agreement with the process and completing the project within the financial constraints and construction timelines. I just thought that was a really good summary of what the concerns about collaboration are, justified concerns in many, in many um, cases. They also articulate concerns about dealing with difficult stakeholders. That's what people really want to talk to us about, is how to manage a process with difficult people or difficult behaviors. Um, and they uh, were concerned about different levels of expertise and open-mindedness and ho worried about leading to watered-down products. So that was the best summary I could come up with, with the overall concerns about collaboration that people were showing. Um, we analyzed the pre and post uh, workshop assessments 
and um, found growth in particular areas and how much they agreed with statements or ideas about collaboration. Basically, I could um, summarize it as uh, it seemed that after the 12 hours instruction that the participants had increased comfort with collaboration and understanding how to manage a collaborative process. Uh, including how to improve communication, how much information to share with the public, and when a facilitator is needed. It, it gave me the impression that people coming in really are, you know, there's so much going on that they, they have a lot of concerns, and with actual specific instruction in each of these topics, there, there's a much higher level of comfort. There was growth and agreement that better facilitation can improve force management. It's useful to have an independent third party to do it, not always necessary, but in controversial areas, possibly, and that everyone agreed that ultimately the Forest Service is responsible for forest management decisions. That actually increased in people's understanding and agreement after the participation and collaboration workshops. I will go ahead and pass this on to Maggie. Are you there, Maggie? I am. Thanks so much, Susie. So uh, this is Maggie again, and I'll finish up the second half of this idea about our SNAP footprint results, process, and relationships. And I'll talk primarily about work that I've been doing um, with Shu Fei Lei, who's a grad student here at Berkeley, and he's sitting in the room with me so he can answer questions as well. But we've been really interested in this idea of um, how do we do better participation in the age of the Internet and in the age of information? And the ways in which we're able to share information and gain um, knowledge and increase participation through the web is really vast. And these, there's a proliferation of ways that people are using the Internet to do this through web mapping, through citizen science, through disaster response. Those are just a few examples. But rarely is impact evaluated or rarely are these websites looked at critically to see if they actually contribute something new or if they are just adding um, something that we already do well in face-to-face -face participation. So that's what we've been thinking about. And so the broader question we've been looking at is the use of the web in adaptive management. And we're doing this in a number of ways, and I've presented to you before our evaluation of our SNAP website. That's case study one, and I won't talk any more about that today. I will talk about case study two, which is looking at information tracking and how do we follow the information products that we've developed in SNAP to understand how they're being used by different parties, how they're being talked about by different parties, and what is the range of our scientific production in SNAP. Just so you know, Shufei is also working on social networks and how do, how do you all fit together in a network of SNAP and how does that network change over time. And he's also looking at the ways in which we discuss things in our public meetings and how those discussion points are sometimes um, uh, done together and sometimes done separately. And I'll talk about that um, at another meeting. But in the interest of time, we're just going to focus on this case study, too, and so we feel that how we manage our public lands in the U.S. is partly about information, who controls the information, who has access to information, where information is flowing and how it's used. And so we wanted to use some new information technology methods to understand the ways in which science, our science products are being used. And so what Chuvet's done is he's... He's mined the web, essentially, to find out where our all of the papers that we write and all of the products that we create, the research briefs, the newsletters, et cetera, how those are being used in the um, virtual world and in the real world. He's also looked at web apps and networks, and he's looked at online media and tried to find out where how SNAP is being uh, utilized. So one of the things that's come out of this is we've been looking at our peer-reviewed publication record, and we have a nice track record of, of publications. And it's easy to see how those are being used because there's a standard protocol for referencing each other. 
So this graph here shows how our SNAP publications have been produced. Those are the blue icons. And then how they've been cited and where those citations take place. We've looked at how this information network exists in distance. We've also looked at it in terms of content. You know, are, are owl researchers citing SNAP owl or is our owl research actually more broadly cited? Um, and we're also looking at who's citing these. Are these other scientists or are these the management community? You know, how are these um, uh, products being cited? And we've seen, you can see here that we have a really wide reach globally, but there is a concentration in academic fields and it is concentrated in, Euro in the U.S. and in Europe. Another um, area that we're looking at is how these um, publications are being cited. And so this graph here just shows through time all of the SNAP publications to date, which are shown in these gray squares. And then <clears throat> they're, when they're published is their far most left icon. And then how they're being published through time is um, these other icons. So publication number one is that Collins et al. paper that's really been cited very well um, across both science and management communities. But we have 24 publications and we're able to track how they're being cited, how, who is citing them, and how they're using the information. If we do look at that first publication from SNAP, this is the Collins et al. paper that was published in 2010. It's had, um, a, it's had a lot of publications, a lot of sightings, so it's been cited um, more than 190 times. And uh, many of these are in uh, reports from agencies, so general technical reports, joint fire science program reports, other things. So we're, we're feeling positive that some of our science um, is reaching uh, managers' hands. Another way that we're looking at SNAP and the information networks associated with our science products is to look at how our SNAP is being talked about in the media. And so these three graphs you see on the left, um, the first is how we actually talk about ourselves when we write blogs about um, or we write research briefs about what we're doing. The second panel is how the popular news or the media is citing us or talking about us. And the bottom panel is how we're being cited in, in the uh, blogosphere, if you will. And the colors of those uh, icons refer to the different domain that's being discussed. So the fissure is the orange circle, the water is the red square, et cetera. And so you can see that actually SNAP had a pretty quick impact in the popular media as well as in the blogosphere really quite quickly. But we ourselves started talking about our science products a little bit later in the day because I think we actually waited for some of our first peer-reviewed journals to come out before we began discussing um, some of our feedback, uh, some of our results um, in the public sphere. So that's a, another interesting finding. So I think to summarize, what we're interested in in this information network arena is we're using readily available information tracking tools. These are things that weren't available to us five years ago to characterize the use of various science and management products from SNAP. And we've been using things like citation analyses and web analytics and content analysis and other means. And I think the, what we're trying to show through this is that our commitment to information transparency has really helped facilitate the flow and use of digital information from SNAP. And we think this helps to form these multi-party collaborations that are so critical to knowledge transfer and learning that Lynn um, is going to talk about later. And importantly, I think this research shows how some of the scientific products have been used to close the loop, if you will, in the adaptive management process. So we're tracking the ways in which the, the scientific information that comes out of SNAMP is being reintegrated into the science community, but also into the management community and into the public at large. 
again, just to summarize, that was a quick summary of this case study too, and we'll talk more in the annual meeting and online about these other arenas of um, ways in which we're engaging with the public. So with that, I'm going to stop and we'll, we're going to um, close here, but I'd be happy to take questions before we move on to the next section. So I, I'm not hearing a whole lot of dialogue and seeing too much in the chat right now, so um, we really do want and need your feedback before we move on about, um, you know, are we looking at the right parameters? Um, we did start this um, process eight years ago or so. Uh, with a very general framing around that triangle um, that grew out of the essential facilitation model of, of measuring success by trying to build working relationships and, and work towards shared results and supporting an open, transparent process. And so we continue to frame our work very generally and, and specifically in those areas, but um, is that is that going to help managers, Pat? Is that going to help managers, Russ, that you work with, or what is what might be missing from your perspective? Um, what kind of input could you give us at this point? Um, yeah, I think um, I think it will help um, the managers some. I'd like to hear David, Dave, uh, Martin, and Victor's take on this as well because they're doing more of this um, closer to the ground. Um, this last section that uh, Maggie talked about in terms of the network analysis, I think I'd like to see some more details on that and, and start to um, identify ways in which the adaptive management loop was closed, if you will. It's a never-ending never circle, but um, if, you know, more details on that would be very helpful. Um, so I'll just leave it at that and kind of leave it to... Mike and Victor, or Dave and Victor, I'm sorry. So Dave, do you have any general comments to, to kick off the, the discussion with other participants on the phone? And then I'll check in with Victor. Yeah, yeah I do. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, certainly all the, all the information and, and, and sharing and the way this has been set up as far as management recommendations and lessons learned has been coming at the same time a whole lot of other collaborative efforts have just been kind of gelling together. So, um, you know, working with the Willow Creek Bunch here and, of course, with the Dinky Bunch down down in the south, side of, south part of the, of the forest, um, and then SFCC and working with the, with the, uh, the Conservancy, it, it's all kind of, it's all very synergistic, and it's, um, and it's kind of hard to put my finger on any one of these things that have been a more benefit than the other or or a, a greater learning than the other. In, in, in my mind, I'm looking at most of the lessons learned and the things that's coming out as far as management recommendations is more of a kind of a toolbox that I have to pick things from now. Um, it certainly broadened our perspective on on better ways to do outreach or looking at, at, at ways that communication that are working, which ones are more effective. Um, but this is, this is kind of part of a, of a number of different um, things that are happening, certainly in our local area, and are really starting to have some spin-offs and some actual projects and other things that are going, in addition to obviously the learning from SNAP and the science and, and the adaptive, the adaptive uh, part of that. So um, it's kind of hard to put my finger on anything um, because it's part of a larger, more synergistic whole that's going on here. You know, you raise a really great point, and Susie captured a, a discussion note about that. One of the commitments early on in the um, SNAP project was a recognition that lots of other collaborative efforts were and are going on, and those need to be acknowledged, and whatever lessons learned that are being shared from those need to be integrated as well. And I'm not sure that we did in this presentation a good job of um, acknowledging that we're doing that. So I think that that's a flag for us going forward, Dave, and a really great point. 
Um, so um, thanks for reminding us of that. And Victor, anything? I know that you're relatively new to this, um, but you've been engaged long enough with um, some of the public participation efforts of your your work before and now. So anything that has um, been relevant to you as a, a manager or things that you think we need to be thinking about? You bet. You know, of the information presented today, I thought it was really interesting to see where the citations were getting used. And <laughs> I thought that was great to see that um, the GTRs were, were citing some of the papers developed um, as part of this effort. And also I wanted to share that the, um, the Forest Service is using some of this information. Some of it's very key to how we're managing the landscape now. For example, the, uh, the papers that are coming out on spotted owl are very important to us and um, affect the decisions on the land management. And um, I also found it was really interesting to see what's getting talked about. You know, outside of, you know, I'm familiar with what's going on within the Forest Service, but it was really interesting to see, you know, in terms of the academic community and the blogosphere, if you will, you know, what's coming up in regards to... Um, you know, where are folks' attention uh, at right now? Are, is fire a hot topic, uh, pardon the pun, <laughs> or mm -hmm. owls or fisher or, you know, which, which area kind of helps me get a pulse on what people are thinking about and where there might be some controversy or maybe some new information or something that I need to tune into. Great, thanks. And one thing I'll say before I call attention to a question from Maggie that Aaron typed in the chat is um, – that as you, Victor, and other agency managers and certainly um, the regional team leaders utilize information from SNAP or other sources that inform and or alter future management decisions, being really thoughtful and deliberate and clear about that, what information is used, how it's being used, and what's been altered for what reason, is going to be absolutely essential to closing the adaptive management loop going forward from SNAP. Because Pat brought that up, and uh, I just want to reiterate, unfortunately, due to all of the constraints, timing, uh, treatments, and related constraints, the public participation team is going to be able to only go so far. And so our hope is to build this capacity, leave these tools in place for the managers, the public, the interested stakeholders so that we can better track and monitor actually how that never-ending uh, adaptive management loop can actually be closed by tracking those things. So I just want to, if you see that happening, help us monitor that. And Adriana and, and members of the team may follow up with you on that to, to see how we can tease that out. So, Aaron asked a question. Um, Maggie, if you want to respond to something with respect to the citation and, and how, sure. you, how you were able to find those. Sure. Thanks a lot, Aaron, for the question. And, and thanks also, Vic, for those um, comments. The, 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 uh, how we found these was Shufe kind of casts a net out there and puts a lot of um, does a lot of searches and then has a lot of these uh, information feeds out there following the the tags of SNAMP and others. And some of these are self-starters. Some of them are we have a relationship, we have a research result, we call it a reporter. But very few of them are. A lot of these were things that we found upon looking. So these were... Um, uh, news items that had either been referred from another news item. So, for example, the the sock drive really caused a lot of a big stir in places that we um, maybe didn't expect. And so, we only knew a, a, one slice of that. But these techniques allow us to see how uh, the project is being talked about in arenas that we're not necessarily following all the time. So I would say it's a real mix between self-generating and then um, just news that we news and blogosphere posts that we found. Maggie, if I could add to that, um, just as far as the sock drive goes, the Fisher sock drive, uh, it was originally a blog post that we wrote, and, um, and then um, it was tweeted 
uh, by our UC communication services. So those folks tell us that Twitter is the way to go for reaching media. And the University of California does have a publicity machine that kind of kicks into gear to some extent when they feel that a story is of interest to the public. Yeah. So I'm very interested in um, whether or not there's others um, on the call participating in this webinar that have any feedback for um, our public participation team thus far on the information, how we're tracking it, how we propose to report the specific efforts of the public participation team um, in the final report. Any other feedback that anyone wants to give us either on chat or by unmuting your phone and just um, sharing with us the entire group? This is Sue. I got a comment. Thank you, Sue. Go for it. Um, so I thought the um, uh, the informatics and network analysis was very uh, you interesting, and and um, it made me want to know a little bit more about how maybe some of those citations actually were directly connect more directly connected to management decisions. And so that, that may not be, um, you know, tease out, you know, one may not be able to tease that out. So there's sort of the indirect how information contributes to the sort of the body and the milieu of knowledge versus uh, a more direct connection to action. So if there were, uh, you know, um, any opportunity to extract that, that would be helpful. Um, and then another thought um, – I think it would be useful this this is an because this is an opportunity for reflection. I think it's important that the part of that reflection include the things that that um, from you know from an external perspective nearly broke down in the process and in some ways broke down in the process in terms of um, the tension between commitment to fund and duration and the post-treatment, the, the, the truncation of the post-treatment um, assessment period. And so I'm not hearing any of that come out in the, um, in the, in the, this report out on the, on the participation side or on the Hello. framing. So, um, so, 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 let so let me... Hi, who, Hello. who just joined the call? <laughs> okay, so Sue, you raised some really great points. I'm not sure who that was. Sue, you're still there though, right? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So, um, Sue, I think that you really raised some excellent points and that we really do, not just as a public participation team, but as an entire science team, need to make certain that we do not gloss over the tensions and the lessons learned that were actually the lessons learned based on, oops, that didn't work so well, or like you mentioned specifically, the constraints we face throughout this long-term eight-year-plus project in terms of the capacity of the MOU partners to commit to the funding to sustain it um, in order to actually close the loop hasn't really been um, an active part of, of the PPT report. And, Peter, I don't know – how um, deliberately it's been part of the UC Science Team final report discussions either. Can you comment on that? We've certainly uh, talked about some of the, the difficulties that have uh, resulted from um, uh, the, the, the various budget um, the budget issues that we that we faced over the um, over the past few years, and I think we will. Mm -hmm. Discuss that sort of that, that, that briefly in the report. How that impacted um, uh, the, the UC Science team's ability to uh, produce the best uh, science that we could, and also produce the most informative uh, management recommendations that we can. For sure, it did have an impact uh, on, on, on the on the UC Science team's uh, products, and so we will try and uh, address that to a certain extent in the in the final report. 
Okay, excellent. So the way we've been framing those things, both in our collaborative adaptive management workshops, and, and we need to capture this, Susie, for our report, is what were the existing boundaries, the non-negotiable things, like the record of Decision 04, and then what were some okay. of the constraints we faced? So those are the important. Hello. Hello, who's joining us? You've joined the Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Project call. Do you, do you want to add to the conversation? No. Okay, so you can mute your phone and, and listen if you'd like. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, other than Sue, any other participants on the call that want to share some immediate feedback before we jump into some of the research results that Lynn and Adriana have to share with us from their interviews? Well, this um, is Maggie, I just, before we do that, I do want to follow up. Erin has posted a follow up question to her earlier question, and I wanted to address that. And then quickly, I wanted to just mention, address the two points that Sue raised, which were excellent. So, can I do that, Kim, before we move on? Sure, and I think somebody else on the line may have more to add, too. Thanks, Maggie. Go ahead. So, Erin just wanted to follow up and say, by, what did I mean by self generated news? Uh -huh. What I meant by that was that when sometimes when we have a research paper published, we do uh, coordinate with our media people, as Lynn was suggesting, and they contact newspapers and, and um, articles are written. And so that's what I mean by self-generated. Does that help, Erin? Well. Great, thanks. And then the, the, those two points that Sue raised, I think, are really great. And so the first one, how do we actually know that the management, the information was used for management? I think what Shufei and I could do is extract all of the, the management uh, documents in which SNAMP is cited and then um, follow up with the managers and say, specifically, you know, can you say uh, what actually is a what, what was done that re, that um, relied on SNAMP information? So Shufei and I will work on um, pulling that together. And then just the side, uh, the second point was about this whole how did SNAP survive that funding, this funding crisis. And we do see in our social network analysis a real change in the network that came um, at the same time as uh, some of our funding crises. So that is, is reflected in um, at least that characterization of our network. Okay, great. Any, any other participants on the line that had a comment or question on this? I, I thought I might have heard someone trying to chime in. Well, that was me, Lynn, and I just was going to say that this kind of thing then can be translated into lessons learned for the future. We also have comments in our interviews about funding issues, which we'll be able to use. Okay, excellent. So it sounds like we're ready to move on to your slides then, um, Lynn, for next steps, I think, in terms of sharing some of the research results. Um, right? Okay. Okay, I think I'm not on mute. Uh, so I need to change the slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about integration metrics. Uh, as you know, and, and Peter could address this more if he wants to, um, part of the final report will be an effort to integrate the different information from the different uh, groups together um, into an integrated report. Um, and we've been struggling with what exactly does public participation contribute to um, an integrated report. And the, the science team has come up with this model. I did want to say this is an integrative project. And I, I expect it to continue to be um, iterative until the very end. We go back and forth on things. But the science team has come up with this um, model. Uh, and so we were thinking, what can we add to this integration and integrated report? And one of the things that we can do, and we have been doing in our interviews, is ask people um, how they, what they've learned and how they've learned it and how has SNAP affected their ideas about the different resources. And, of course, um, oh, let's see, i got to push right button. A little discombobulated. Of course, um, we're the public participation team, uh, but we thought that we could 
ask people about all the different resources that SNAP has been studying. Um, the other factor, or the other element of this model, of course, is how um, splats affect the resources, how splats affect the fire hazard. Those are the strategically placed land area treatments, the fuel treatments that we've been studying. Uh, and how the, um, so let's just talk about the interviews. I wanted to say that um, this process is a process of qualitative research. It's not um, uh, like a, a mail survey or something where you're trying to find out how many of people feel this way or that and how many people more this way and how many people feel more that way. Um, the idea is to capture and explore the variation of opinions. Then you can use that um, to develop a, a quantitative survey, which we'll be doing in the early spring. And we hope that you'll all participate. And I'd also like to thank the people that have participated in the interviews so far. Um, I did highlight statements that were unusually common, just for your information. We did a before survey. We're following a before-after design here. We did it before interviews. We did after interviews. We did some interviews about the history of local areas, and we did learning uh, interviews about learning not that long ago. Um, I'm going to be talking about the after surveys today. All right. And we talked to Forest Service people, University of California people, MOUP partners, and other stakeholders, again, with the idea of capturing the variation of responses. Now, because we're trying to do after, we're still analyzing the data. So these are our preliminary preliminary interpretations, and um, we have an opportunity to do more. We have really a lot of data, and so the feedback that we can uh, offer us today that um, will help us to um, pick out which kind of information is more important to you. We would appreciate that kind of feedback today. Let me get rid of this little pointer. SNAP did influence participant definitions of forest health. He asked people if it did. For some people, it expanded their definitions of forest health, um, that, it, that SNAP changed their perception, mostly by broadening what they thought of as forest health. Some people felt that they already had had a pretty good idea and that SNAP um, didn't change their ideas, but it did affirm their previous definitions. So the expanded definitions of forest health, that people said they had expanded their definitions. Many people said that they incorporated more about water into how they thought about forest health. And the water was, some people still felt that it's a rather nebulous term. Uh, some people said that they avoided now using value-laden terms such as catastrophic fire, which is interesting. The people who said that the, the project reinforced their existing definitions um, felt that it had affirmed what they already thought about forest health, and that they came to SNAP already with a fairly solid perspective. But they did learn a few things. They learned more about how to take care of a forest. They learned about forest service techniques. They feel more informed. They learned specifically about the mixed conifer forest. And some people said that they would have liked to have discussed forest health more within the project. Now, we also asked people what they thought of the treatment impacts on forest health at Sugar Pine and Last Chance. And the people who answered this question tended to be people who had seen the treatments or somehow had felt or learned enough to be able to answer. So not everybody answered these questions. And the basic response, and this, this kind of thing applies to both sites, is that some people believe that there was increased resiliency, reduced sand density, but it's Interesting that in also in general, many several people commented that they thought the treatments were pretty light, especially at sugar pine, and that more could have been done. But in terms of increased resilience, I'll just share a few quotes with you. The treatments were done well, and they tried to preserve biodiversity in multi-age stands, all the things I think of as part of health, forest health. Reduced stand density and understory. Density was at a level where you could protect the forest from fire or insect attacks. Um, they did density control or stocking control. They maintained the structure in the forest and had different species and age classes. And then some people commented that, and this explains some of what they meant about why they needed to, more, to do more. Um, put more holes in the canopy, as described in these GTRs. Uh, do more underburning. Some people felt that there was no change in forest health because they didn't treat enough. But nobody commented that they felt the forest was less healthy as a result of the project. Last chance, again, a lot of similarities with sugar pine. 
Um, some people said the aesthetics were better um, and looked more like the historical forest. Um, one very specific comment was that the cable unit uh, they thought was more, they're not convinced that that's more fire resilient. Um, some things that are different, someone did say, or at least some people said it was less healthy because they took too many big trees and that they thinned too much. A number of people said they didn't know. Uh, some possible negative treatment impacts that people pointed out was erosion and lack of soil fertility and regeneration. And here, this last comment is one that is really common in a lot of um, the um, things I'm going to talk about, is that people are waiting for results. They're waiting for the results to come out. And so this makes us more aware of the kinds and level of expectations people had uh, for the results of many of our, our studies. We asked people how treatments would influence fire behavior. And all but, but one participant were positive about that, interestingly. But many were concerned that really extreme weather would overwhelm the treatments, um, especially at Sugar Pine. Uh, they felt that the fire, the burning in last chance, uh, showed the effectiveness of the treatments. Um, and some people felt, yes, there will be a small short-term impact on the wildlife despite the beneficial effects on the fire. Now, no one said their opinions changed dramatically about this in the last seven years, but as a result of SNAP, um, people felt they learned a lot more about the context, about forest management, how decisions are made, the different techniques people use for fuels, and public opinions about the project, and they learned some forest ecology. People who didn't feel that SNAP had um, influenced them very much um, felt that the project had mostly reaffirmed their opinions, and they wanted to see, again, the results. So moving on past forest health, we can look at the fissure and how uh, people felt the project and the treatments affected the fissure. So in terms of the treatment from the fissure, um, in the short term, many felt that they might have some negative effects. But if treatment planning takes into consideration fissure needs, then perhaps not so detrimental to the fissure, even in the short term. So this is an opinion expressed. Uh, they, some people felt there would be long-term positive effects from reduced severe fire, um, unless, and this is a concern that was voiced, uh, the treatments uh, cause short-term changes that would lead toward listing the species. Uh, other issues were more important than the treatments. People learned that. Um, the rodenticides and roadkill and predation were having a, a large impact on the species. Some people said there weren't enough of treatment areas to influence this fissure. And lots of people, again, just didn't know yet. We're waiting for more results. Did SNAP change your opinions about the fissure and the treatment? Yes, largely through learning. Learning gets emphasized a lot here. Uh, they learned about all these impacts on the fissure. I've already mentioned, but here's a quote. When SNAP first started, I thought we would see more of an impact on the fissure, and now I think they have a wider variety of habitat that they choose to use than I had initially thought. And this, per, this next comment, people who felt that it didn't really change their opinion but reinforced their opinion, SNAP is helping me to understand that the way I saw it is correct, that there won't be an effect. Another comment, we do have more information about the fissure now, but not really enough information about how it responds to disturbance. And again, a certain number of people feel they really need the results to form more of an opinion. If we move on to another one of the studied resources, the OWL. Again, short term might have negative effects. That was an opinion that was voiced by a number of people, but again, taking into consideration owl needs, then maybe the treatments won't be so difficult or so detrimental, even in the short term. There would be long-term positive effects from reduced severe fire, um, except for one person who, again, said that treatments might lead to listing. And another person said, or another group of people said, there are too few owls in the study area. The treatment area is too small to see an effect. And a number of people just really didn't know yet. Again. Now, what about fire versus treatments for owls? We asked specifically about this, about all our resources, but I'll tell you about what people said about owls. Um, the treatment is relatively positive, and fire is kind of, uh, severe fire is negative, is it one group of people's response. Uh, treatments won't have much effect on the owls compared to a fire, a high-intensity fire, 
A low-intensity fire or a smaller scale during the cooler seasons, however, or one that leaves a mosaic of effects would be good for the owl. And an acknowledgement that prescribed fires are very difficult with conditions, as they are, so treatments are, are needed um, because it's too dangerous and there aren't enough burn days. So those are reasons why people thought the treatments uh, were useful. Another group of people, a general comment was that the treatments are negative and fire is negative too. The treatments aren't enough and there's too little too late and we need to have a massive prescribed fire program. So to summarize the treatment effects on wildlife in people's opinions, again, short term might have a negative impact, but we need to consider the needs of the species that we've learned about. Um, that the long-term positive impacts from reduced severe fire are important, although listing would not be a good idea if that results from the treatment. Um, other issues are more important to the fisher than the treatment, and there's not enough owls in the study area or the treatment area with too small to see impacts on the owls. Um, to follow up on something that um, Maggie talked about in terms of the number of events and the amount of interest um, clearly, the wildlife parts of SNAP generate the most broad interest, I would say, and that's reflected also in the interviews. So, finally, we looked at water quality and its impact on people's responses. Well, water is something that I think more people were unfamiliar with than the other resources. So there's a big diversity of opinions, and Adriana can add to this if she wants, but um, people seem to not be sure of the differences between water quality, what you look at with quality and with abundance or productivity of water. So the opinions are quite diverse, but most be many people felt the treatments were positive because they reduced the negative impact of the fire. They increased water quantity. Um, but people had different ideas about how that happened or, or what caused that. Uh, some people said they're using the best management practices, so we don't expect to see an effect. Treatments will have minimal effect. They might have a short-term negative effect, but the treatments are too light. We won't see any effect. Now, what do we do with all this information? Um, well, we'll look at fire versus treatment first. Treatment positive, fire negative. Um, people had uh, ideas about why wildfire is bad. Um, it had both negative short and long-term impacts. Um, you get uh, lowered water quality when you have more rainfall and erosion um, because there's no vegetation to keep the water on the landscape. Um, increased erosion and turbidity in the water and ash. Um, soils become hydrophobic, so people had ideas about why wildfire would be a problem. Um, they also said, again, some that low-intensity fire might have similar effects as treatment, might have some positive impacts. So clearly, a lot of us feel that if we could do low-intensity fire and prescribed burning, if it could be used more broadly, it would be preferable or a good idea for both wildlife and water. And people have high expectations of the research results. So if we go back and we look, Got a little carry with the animations, I admit. And we look at and try to summarize all of these results. Uh, it seems that it's very common for people to say that treatment is better and has much less impact compared to the devastation from a severe fire. But a concern is that the treatments might be too light to prevent like a rim fire type severe fire or to affect wildlife and water. The short-term impacts may cause some negative impacts. In some cases, they learned from the project that this is not as bad as they thought it might have been. The long-term impacts are generally positive if they feel assured that it will reduce severe fire. Prescribed fire would be more acceptable, but most recognize the difficulty of implementing it. Learning from SNAP is, again and again, and we learned this from our during survey when we talked specifically about learning, but it didn't often change people's opinions c completely. It, def it broadened their understandings and their definitions, which is not, not a small thing. Um, so people, uh, I think, learned to think more broadly um, as a result of, of the learning that went on uh, through the project. 
Now, one thing that Mike Chappell asked us to do in the early part, or suggested that he'd like to see come out of the project, is the creation of, of a set of relationships and a, a group of very involved stakeholders who really had learned about um, the issues and learned about the ecological and other effects of, of management decisions and understood management decisions better. And I feel that uh, in the project, we have made progress in that direction. One of the three things that is listed in a paper by Arnold et al. On, on adaptive management processes is that enhancing learning, building the social legitimacy for decision making, and establishing relationships that support learning and adaptation in the long term are three big things that you should hope to get out of an adaptive management collaborative process. Now, SNAP is not a grassroots project. It didn't start with a group of you know, like-minded people getting together and saying we need to start something like the Quincy Library Group or the Malpai Borderlands Group. And so it didn't, the project didn't start with a, a strong group of relationships or an organic set of relationships to begin with. And we don't have a fully democratic governance process, obviously. We have, um, the Forest Service has its institutional constraints. And one of the things that we've really learned from SNAP is that scientists have a set of constraints about what they can and cannot do and will and won't do. And so um, you don't, you know, you don't have a fully level playing field here in SNAP. But despite these institutional and technical limits to power sharing, which is a goal of some projects, I think there has been an environment created that's conducive to social learning, which is characteristic of democratic collaborative projects. So there's been a lot of shared learning, and I think the university has had a mediating role, and scientists have reported directly to the public. I think that's helped with building social legitimacy for decision-making, and the Forest Service has shared uh, many of their processes directly with the public as part of this process as well. So our question, I think, that we'll, we'll try to address in the, in the remaining analysis of our interviews, but we did ask people how... Um, they felt the Forest Service and the university and other stakeholders um, responded to the project, um, as well as now we will do a quantitative analysis based on an email survey. We're trying to wait um, as long as we can for more results to come out before we do that for obvious reasons. But um, a question we will want to interrogate is have long-term relationships that support the use of project findings after the university role has ended. Have we developed those? And Maggie gave a very good treatment of one way of looking at that, which is through these papers that will be around for a while that then get incorporated into management and so on and so forth. And we'll be looking more at other relationships there. So um, with that, uh, I think, Kim, you wanted to maybe say a few words and open it up to discussion. Right. Well, I want to thank everybody um, for your help through um, the um, discussion and through the challenges there. That was great. I really appreciate everyone's efforts to support success. And we really are trying to get your input before it's too late to change our final report and make sure it's relevant and meaningful, make sure we're really tracking the things that matter, and to build on some of the comments that Sue Britting made and some of the results that Lynn just shared, it's obvious that a lot of the participants in their feedback to Lynn and Adriana indicate that they don't know yet because they're waiting for results. And so what we really want to make sure that we leave with the uh, MOU agency partners and the interested stakeholders is a final report that will help um, document the results that we will have at the end of, of the project and also hopefully a process that will be available to be used so that as additional results come up because of the timing that you'll all have the capacity to make sure to document how those results are informing future management. So that's really what we want now is your feedback in terms of either questions on the chat or if you can um, state your name and, and raise your question or concern we really would appreciate your feedback um, on the entire work we're doing and our proposal to integrate the final report. So, Lynn and Adriana, there's a question in the chat about um, interview mm -hmm. responses and whether you correlated them or plan to correlate them with uh, general stakeholder evaluations. Um, 
Okay, so I could answer that. Um, in our, obviously, um, Adriana just finished uh, the interviews um, a week ago, I believe, and so we haven't had time to look at all of the things we can do with the data, but we did look at this, and Adriana, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in the earlier uh, interviews and email survey, and we didn't find that affiliation really predicted what people had to say. So there, there. I think people have been quite frank with us and expressed their feelings, um, regardless of whether they're scientists or Forest Service or uh, and um, well NGO people or, or general public. I think, of course, scientists are more a little more concerned about the science aspects, but um, I don't. There was no clear demarcation where Forest Service people feel strongly this way and scientists feel strongly that way. Um, did you notice anything, Adriana, thinking back to the interview? Yeah, no, I would agree with what you said. This is Adriana Sulek. Um, I agree with what you just said about the um, previous interviews we've done so far in our analysis, and then for the what the justice in, um, integration section, I haven't looked at it by um, uh, affiliation, but I can say that some of those strong opinions were not from environmental groups, if that's what you were wondering. So if you haven't done it by affiliation, how do you feel so comfortable saying that, Adriana? Well, just because there were a few comments there that said that there was one person who said X, Y, and Z about listing or whatever, and I was just trying to make it clear that that was not necessarily an environmentalist or, um, you know, I, I, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's worried that you might have misconceptions. Yeah. Well, and I, I would just say... Um, that I think we all, one thing that I've learned is that we all have to, and this might be part of the learning that Lynn and Adriana uh, showed in their, um, from the overall interviews they had, which is the importance of language. Um, even using the word environmentalist, what does that really mean? I mean, I would consider myself an environmentalist, but if you were going to look at my affiliation, I would be a university science team member, right? So, but one of the one of the key languages that words and definitions that I think the public helped us helped me and helped the science team I think as a whole is to be really careful about the words we use and I don't know that that, that this finding was in the slides today but I've seen it in the other work Lynn and Adriana have done and the work that we've done is we don't use the term catastrophic fire anymore. We try very hard in our work as science team members not to use that term because it's not um, scientifically measurable. We've got, we really are trying to be clear and consistent about using terms related to the severity of a fire and um, the low, medium, high definitions that can be measured and discussed and what you, people may not agree with those definitions, but we can have shared understanding because the term catastrophic really is a value-laden term about catastrophic to who or what or what resource or value. And so I think that's been the power and that's that broadening piece that I think might benefit from some discussion and input from managers and the folks on the line. Comments? Um, we did have one comment where some one of the one of the or I don't know how many, but some stakeholders did say that they don't use the term catastrophic fire anymore, so it wasn't there, which was great. We struggled with that some in our own team. So um, here's a comment from Sue. I think one of the things that's hard for me about public opinion research is understanding the. Um, you know, it, it's, I suppose one can get a sense of the breadth of the comment, but the intensity of comments is mm -hmm. unclear. And so, um, you know, it's it's part of my bean counter uh, sort of right. perspective. And um, I don't, you know, whether I guess I'm I'm uh, hoping that you can um, address strength of response in some mm -hmm. in some way. Um, uh, but anyway, that's. Okay, so that is absolutely true, Sue. So to judge the strength of response, um, you have to be, I mean, one thing that, that, that really matters is who you ask, right? So 
we have only we do this um, qualitative research, which gives us an opportunity to go into more depth with people and to um, get the variety of responses and what people feel about this and that and the other thing. But to get the intensity of the response, we really need to ask more people and at a broader scale so that it becomes a reasonable sample. And some people have been asking about demographics. That also we need, you know, the demographics you get is going to depend on who you ask. That's always a big problem in, in quantitative research. So we do plan in, um, or I believe it's in June or maybe a little earlier, to do uh, an email survey where we get a much broader uh, number of respondents so that we can look at some of these things. So we will be able to give you an intensity of response and we'll, we'll be able to uh, pull out of that what's the intensity of response among people who've been coming to SNAP meetings, among people who are with uh, the university, different groups. We will definitely be able to pull uh, some things out of that. We also asked um, whether people are growing up in a forest and, and things like that. But if you don't do interviews, those kinds of surveys are often completely misinterpreted and biased because people don't ask the right questions because they have no idea of what kinds of opinions and ideas are out there. So I really feel firmly or strongly, I feel very strongly, that we need both kinds of research to get the full picture. So we do expect to do um, this quantitative uh, survey that will give you those kinds of results. But obviously, especially now, when you look at the qualitative information and you see how many people um, are saying, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, the later we do it, uh, the, the more informative it will be. So about the latest we can do it is in June. Those kinds of responses are extremely easy to interpret, so that won't take us very long, or extremely easy to analyze compared to qualitative research. So that won't take us very long, but we will have that for you. So that's another constraint we can note too, Sue, is that, you know, we have to adjust those timing and, and that waiting for results comment that's so common is going to affect the, the strength of those, the feedback we get. But like I say, hopefully we'll have a process in place and we'll have built capacity along the way and the related collaborative efforts that many of you are engaged in in your communities and other efforts. Um, that have gone on along with or in addition to this project are all going to add um, to the knowledge and to the process learning. So, Dave Martin, um, you have a question and a comment that you wanted to share in terms of um, your interest in how many more folks have become engaged in forest management and collaboration because of SNAP itself. Is that is that correct? Um, yeah, that's Kind of what I was thinking, you know, top part of that discussion before about the synergy and, and all these things kind of going on at the same time. I'm just, I'm curious as to the, you know, from the information we've gathered, what affected what? In other words, um, and especially SNAP and all the things that went on with that, did that in fact cause a lot more people to become engaged in the various collaborative efforts that we have going on on, on this forest and other things? In other words, um, SFCC, Willow Creek, Dinky, Dinky Collaborative did SNAP. Was it a, a, a primary mover or, a, or, or an important reason why they became engaged in this or not? Well, if you don't mind, Dave, can I ask you that question? From your own perspective as a district ranger um, who, who uh, was gifted this SNAP project on your district, um, I remember how excited you and your team were when you were uh, – where you came down there, um, you embraced it because you were already saw some of the power and potential of collaborative efforts from your own efforts in the community. Isn't that correct? Yes. So you already had um, some experience and some um, hy working hypothesis that this could be a beneficial approach. And I'm not sure if that's true or not for um, the American River Ranger District. And, of course, Victor, you – weren't part of SNAP when it first started, but um, just from your understanding and history of that area, were there very, very many collaborative types of efforts going on eight years ago or so in that area? You know, I couldn't speak to that as I wasn't here eight years ago. Right. So we, we have some of that information, and there was less, definitely less there, but there's still, there's you know, there's been ebbs and flows of this, at least in my career uh, within forestry. 
the forestry and um, the uniqueness about what SNAP may have contributed, um, maybe we can extract because of the model that Lynn presented, which is the other collaborations in general grew out of kind of grassroots, local, organic ideas and needs and priorities. And this one came out of a pretty high level conflict between the state and federal resource agencies in, sure. in response to the record of decision. So I think that there are there's some some things that SNAP contributed to, but some things that would have maybe happened with or without SNAP. And we may never be able to fully tease it apart, but your input may help us. Not just yours, Dave and Victor, but everybody who participated. So um Alyssa, for example, uh, uh, you you've been involved in many collaboratives, and and um, you know you probably have some really strong opinions about what SNAP may or may not have contributed to your collaborative efforts at a local level or a regional level. And Sue has a couple comments too because she's been involved since the original MOU. So do you want to share that with the group, Sue? Um, sure. I, I was thinking about, um, you know, I, I think what I'm looking for from um, the the final report outs and, and information is really, ha you know, the, trying to have enough information for people to understand where uh, the process um, is most effective and in, in the tools, most of things that were most effective versus the things that were not and, and then how one would do something differently in the future. And so one of the things I was thinking about, you know, the, the before and after interviews that were done, and um, one thing that's pretty challenging about any of that is uh, that the period of time has been so long. It's seven years. And so the thing that I see more and more just from my work is that the continuity of people changes over that time. And um, it, just as we had this conversation with Victor, he wasn't around then. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, there can be uh, lots of information, but, but that doesn't mean that beneficial things aren't happening. And so, um, but, but one thought I had while that conversation was going on was um, as a part of your review, have you gone back to extract out the expectations in the MOU and then examine to the, what, because the MOU is very much more focused on the adaptive management, establishing adaptive management process, public participation, and, and a very much, uh, um, you know, the stakeholder focus. And so that might be, you know, it might be important in your final reporting to really be focused, to, to at least have some pretty intent focus on if this was what was requested of the process, what parts were we able to meet? What parts weren't we able to meet? And you know, and, and, and it could even be a we were able to meet this, these parts because of X, Y, and Z. We ain't, weren't able to meet these parts because of you know one, two, and three. As a way of helping us understand, is was that MOU the right tool to use to to accomplish something? Um, in, you know. Did it did it actually accomplish the thing we were attempting to do, which was resolve um, these these as you referred to some high level conflicts, um, and 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 that information that kind of going back and being very particular is important because right now we're facing revisions on the three southern forests that uh, really are contemplating some of the same issues. What is a, you know, what is a monitoring, how do we do adaptive management, all of those things are going to uh, feed in. And, and then I, I think the other thing that I'm not hearing yet is really what is the role of the experimental scientists, science, in this adaptive management loop. And, and, and that's, you know, that's not exactly science and the uh, application of research is not really a part of the adaptive management, or rather the monitoring plans that are going to be embedded in the forest plans. And so there's, this is an interesting time to be able to weigh in and clarify how those pieces of research with um, the ongoing, the expectations
conditions of monitoring in a forest plan might actually fit together. Excellent suggestions. That's really great. Okay, we, we definitely need to review that um, and make sure that we are looking at the MOU. And, and Peter, I think you and I uh, can make sure that we do that as we frame the, the next IT meetings and the next um, discussions on our final report. And Susie, thank you so much. You're capturing it. Sue, make sure that it and others as Susie takes the notes that we capture the essence of your feedback. I had one, just one more. Um, it, it's not. It's kind of tangential to this, but I um, was wondering if you, if, if if there was any way that you were assessing the costs of um, the the effort, and and that. Not just, I mean, I know we have budget information for the stamp focus folks, but for instance, the cost, estimating costs of the stakeholder and agency participation. And, um, you know, and, and there's, there are interesting, I mean, costs are interesting because they, um, you know, you have, you, you forego other opportunities because you have to invest time or energy, money into certain activities. So, if we had some sense of that cost, it would help uh, recognize, I think, in some ways that stakeholders bear a lot of costs <coughs> in processes and it, when, when we're talking about collaborative process and, um, you know, I don't know if there's anything in the survey that you're sending out to more general um, you know, a larger body if one could include questions about in costs and investments and um, other opportunities foregone to pers to engage in the SNAP process and how people felt like, um, you know, whether they felt that investment was a worthy one or not. That's a great idea. Um, Lynn and Adriana, do you think that we can integrate something like that into that final survey? <laughs> We could certainly ask people whether they felt that their investment was worthy. Um, to really get at cost could be, we'd have to develop some metrics that are sort of universal. But I, I certainly like to think about it. I, I think that's a really good point. And, and Sue and others um, may recall very early in the first public meetings associated with the work plan development, there was a lot of lively discussion and debate about including an economic component from the beginning um, as a factor so that the true economics in terms of not just the cost of the project, but the cost and, and benefits of the overall effort could be better tracked. And so that is an, that's an acknowledged constraint from the beginning, but there might be some way to capture that. And I certainly hope that uh, you all know how much we appreciate the time and effort and input you've given us through these public participation team meetings and the integration team meetings. Um, obviously, we couldn't be successful without that. So we're glad that you're making the choice to participate, and we should somehow de better develop a way to acknowledge and recognize it. So that's really true. So there was comments, I think, from others, too. Did I miss Others on the line that might want to say something. Um, so Sarah's typed a comment about. Um, oh, so if if there's a way in which um, particular participation uh, and the con contributions to the project could be better framed as we pr provide the results, that might be a way of of doing that type of acknowledgement. Is that a correct interpretation, Sarah? Sounds like it. So any other questions or comments or feedback that you want to give us in the remaining 10 minutes? This is Maggie. It strikes me that that last point of Sue's, we could actually get a handle on also because we do have the number of hours of time that all everybody participated in meetings and other things. And we could, you know, provide a ballpark of what that represents in terms of hours. It's some. Um, it's a significant number of. It's a significant number of days that you all have spent with us. And That's we could, a great way to capture it. Um, it's only the tip of the iceberg. 
Yeah, and, and I guess I would offer up that you, I mean, I do estimates for reporting of either volunteer or contributed time for work that, uh, you know, the NGO that I work with, that we we contribute to other efforts. And so there are reasonable estimates you can make in terms of costs associated with volunteer time, with travel costs, so that you could come up with a number that was not a, uh, a dollar value that was not a bogus number. It could have some integrity to that number. Right, that's right. We'll definitely flag that as something we can work on as a team and then maybe get that back out to um, the SNAP participants for feedback before we get it into the final survey. Um, speaking about commitments and time, I do want to draw your attention to something that Susie has posted on the right-hand side of your screen, which is um, a list of, oh, and now it's front and center. Thank you, Susie. Um, so it's a list of some of the integration team meetings that are coming up in this final year. And it does demonstrate the point that it's a marathon. And that's one of the reasons why your feedback um, to us about what worked well about this webinar and what could be better um, is going to be helpful because these are all planned as face-to-face -face meetings, interactive meetings. Um, if there is a need or a value in having a meeting like this to tie loose ends together, your kind of feedback on that would be helpful. But right now, uh, it's my understanding, Susie, that all of these meetings you have listed here are intended to be face-to-face -face meetings at this point, correct? Yeah, that's right. Today's was as well, um, and there were some uh, conflicts with people's schedules, and we decided that we wanted a minimum attendance, uh, and we didn't meet that, and that's why we switched to the webinar. And, you know, it would be interesting to get people's feedback to see is that the way to go with some of these other meetings. I think most of them will have good attendance, although we also consider doing the spatial meeting as a webinar because they have had less uh, controversy and less attendance in the past as well. So towards that end, in the remaining five minutes or so we have, um, I would really like to encourage you through the chat or through open dialogue to tell us what worked well about this and then we can switch to what we could do better. Um, Susie and, and team, I don't know if you can follow up with a more uh, one of our more normal uh, surveys, uh, evaluations for folks to give us feedback. Yes, uh, Kim, and let me just interject there that I have put on an online evaluation survey. If you see the next box below, that's the web links. And all people need to do is highlight the webinar evaluation survey and then click Browse to, and it'll open it up in another browser in their win in their computer screen. So that Susie, is, you think we synchronized this, but nope, she's just so organized. So you can give us your feedback on that evaluation survey, and we really do listen to your input. We take it to heart, and we try to improve based on the feedback you give us. If you have any immediate feedback you want to share, um, we're open to hearing about what worked well and, and what could be better. Um, so the shorter time frame really did help folks, um, as well as, um, the, as Dave Martin said as he logged on, thank you for saving me the travel time. That's always a benefit. Um, so what else worked well about the webinar um, in terms of results, process, and relationships? Um, the slides were very clear and easy to follow, so um, appreciate that. Um, uh, Maggie, the um, timeline and, and sort of uh, th those graphs that you showed were very, just you could get it right away, so thanks. Great. Anything else that worked well for folks? I think you, I also I think you had the right amount of content for uh, the, the two-hour slot and then enough to then have conversation back and forth. So sometimes you don't get enough time to, to chat back and forth, so I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a hard, especially in a webinar, so I'm glad it worked. So what can we do to make it better next time? If we do another webinar, 
for this topic or any other topic related to the project? What could we do to make it better? Is it possible to uh, contemplate using a web interface that um, allows you to control participants? We will, <laughs> we will definitely look into that, absolutely. <laughs> And, and I, I use one with um, uh, CCP um, if you're looking for a particular um, uh, type. And it works quite well, and, they, and one can control a lot of things in it. Great. I think, Su I, I think Susie did figure out how to turn off one person, right, on the phone anyway. Yes, I was on on the ReadyTalk uh, technical assistance line, and I do have it figured out. I'm ready for Roger if he comes back. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. I'm sorry about that. I hadn't done a webinar in this style before, but next time I'm ready. So thank you, though, Sue, and we may uh, follow up with you for any tips and techniques you have. I thought that it was a test of my skills. You guys planted him. <laughs> So anything else that we could do better next time? If you think of it and you feel comfortable sharing it on the evaluation, we welcome that. Also, if you have feedback on these upcoming integration team meetings uh, about the format and or content for those meetings that you want to give to us in advance, that would be really helpful because we want to make those as relevant and meaningful as possible, we want to make sure they're effective use of your time. So any of those upcoming meetings that you have comments on in terms of format, content, and uh, anything else about it, we would really appreciate it. Um, also, um, you know, Peter took the time to participate in this, and um, he's going to be really critical in bringing the final report together with John Battles. So any feedback you have on that final report, in addition to the things you shared with us today already that were very helpful, um, please feel free to get to us and or to Peter. Anything else, Susie or team, that I'm forgetting or participants as we get ready to wrap up? Good job. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being flexible and making this work. I'm really, really grateful to Susie and team for pulling this together. I, I appreciated Susie's capacity to take those notes and, and provide those right on the screen for all of us. That was helpful. And as always, Kim and Ann will work to get the notes out. So thanks, team. Have a great day.